or if they say we need to um, extract the wisdom in all religions or in other religions, like there are, there's wisdom in other religions and we, we should not ignore that. That may be a sign that they're following the perennial um, tradition. Perennialism. This is something that you actually wrote to me and said, I think we need to talk about this because this isn't just something that's in the progressive church. It's actually coming into more mainstream evangelical churches as well. So why don't you start by telling us just a general idea of what perennialism is, and then we'll talk about where we're seeing this in the evangelical church. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, and it's great to be on with you again, by the way, Elisa. Always. <laughs> um, Yes, perennialism, which is also called perennial wisdom or per, the perennial philosophy or the perennial tradition, so you can see it under all those names, is a view that all religions at their core have the same truth, or they might say it's the same divine reality. Mm. So outwardly, they admit outwardly the practices are different and the doctrines look different. Um, and that's the exoteric side, E-X-O-T-E-R-I-C, as opposed to esoteric, which is the more hidden hidden part of, of it, which is the core of all religions. And all religions come from that core and are based on it. And um, what the perennial followers believe is that it is fine to adhere to one religion, um, but it's because you'll benefit from, from whatever is in that religion, but you are aware, if you're a perennial follower, you're aware of this, this truth that unites all religions. So you, you kind of have this insight into the real meaning behind everything or the real source of everything, which in, to me is sort of Gnostic because it's not obvious. Yeah. And so uh, what you have is people who may say they are a Christian or they're Jewish or they're Hindu, but they follow the perennial philosophy. And so often they will say, I um, follow the Christian tradition or the Christian wisdom tradition or the Hindu tradition. So sometimes, though, if they're not if they don't mind saying it, they'll say it. Yeah. And so that's one one kind of thing to, to notice. Uh, but a lot of times you can't really tell because the person just won't say, I, I follow perennial wisdom. Um, and that's one of the problems is I think it's hard for most people to recognize it because, uh, first of all, most people don't know about it. And it's really something I heard about years ago um, as, a, as a fairly new Christian but I hadn't known about it before. And once I understood it, once I started reading about it and reading some things from perennial followers, it helped me get a big picture of it because you see it, it's a bigger piece of the puzzle that other pieces fit into. Mm. So it helped me understand a lot of things. And like Richard Rohr, who yeah. he's very open about being a follower of the perennial philosophy and he pushes it. Yeah, aggressively. It's on his. It's all over his website. Uh, in yeah. fact, I just pulled up. A, there's several blog posts about it. Uh, he describes it as the perennial tradition points to recurring themes and truths within all of the world's religions. At their most mature level, religions cultivate in their followers a deeper union with God, each other, and with reality or what is. And so essentially he's saying, yeah, the Hindu at, at the most mature level of that religion is actually communing with God. And so he'll say, I'm a perennialist, of the, a Christian perennialist of that tradition, but he's not going to make that an exclusive uh, belief that somebody would have to have uh, to where you would have to repudiate belief in other religious ideas. Would you right. say that's that's pretty accurate there? Yes, it is. They they do not believe in blending religions. In other words, they're not, they don't want a one world religion where all the religions kind of blend together. They believe in the separate uh, or the distinct religions because they think they offer different things to different people, especially in the culture. So they might say Hinduism 
you know, really is the end is for India is the way that they have their faith and the way they learn about truth and who God is. So yeah. they don't see a problem with different religions. Um, so, and because so they believe that at the core, there's this common truth, uh, they don't see that there's any difference in how everything will end up because they believe everybody is going to end up in a good place right. because that's that's because of the truth, because everyone's really following something that is based on truth, even if they aren't aware of it. Now, they may they do say things like um, you uh, have to become aware of this. And, you know, if you aren't aware of it, you kind of miss out on this very profound truth. You're, you're kind of on the surface of the religion mm. and you're following that religion, but you're missing out on this deeper truth. Yeah. And so they, you have to kind of awaken to that. Mm. You have to become aware of it. And, um, you, and then you have to see it. So even if someone tells you about it, you have to kind of find it on your own and understand it and mm. see it. And then it puts you at a deeper level, according to them, of your faith and you get more benefit from being at that deeper level. And that's kind of, I think how Richard Rohr is calling it a, like a less mature version of Christianity yes. would yes. be one that might say Jesus died for my sins as a sacrifice to reconcile us to God. In fact, he's called that a toxic kind of mindset to have toward yes. God. And so the, the higher levels, the more mature levels of, of each religion um, essentially really is going to be moving more toward in the new age idea of oneness. So Marcia, is this basically universalism or is this something different or how do those two ideas interact with each other? Yes, uh, it, it, it certainly looks like what one would call universalism. I think the reason I wouldn't use that phrase is because universalism is a very broad term and they're actually different forms of universalism. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I think it's, it's a good term if you're speaking of something very broadly. But, so I would say per, the perennial philosophy fits in that idea, but it's a specific form of universalism. And it has its very specific people and history and uh, the way that it's presented. And of course, I'm more familiar with uh, the way it's being presented by Christian followers yeah. of, of the perennial philosophy than I am of, of somebody else. But I have come across some. Um, I came across a conference I was looking at, and it was a conference on contemplative practices. Mm -hmm. And um, they had a one of the people who was speaking was a Jewish man, and he was a Jewish follower of the perennial philosophy. And in fact, it looked like most of them were. And this is something I've discovered. There is a big tie between contemplative practices and the perennial philosophy to the extent that Elisa... I actually think a lot of the people deeply into contemplative practices are followers of perennial philosophy, including Christians that I've looked at. Well, that would make sense because Richard Rohr, of course, that's his main thing is contemplative yes. spirituality and practices. And then he's tying that with perennialism. That makes perfect sense. But where where do you see this? Because uh, we mentioned we're, we're not just seeing this in fringe sort of movements, or we're not mm -hmm. just seeing this in progressive Christianity, y you in your research, the reason you felt like this was so important to talk about is because we're seeing this actually in the, in the evangelical church. We're seeing this among yes. the more mainstream Christian church. Talk about that a bit and wh what can yes. people be looking for? And I want to, I just remembered a point I wanted to make that I forgot yeah. to make. And that is they believe that you access this core truth in the perennial philosophy through mysticism. Ah. You access it through experience, and that's why they are very big on contemplative practices. Okay. Because through those practices, you're sort of transformed, your consciousness is transformed, and you are able to see the what the, what the truth is, the, the truth of this perennial view. So that's a very important thing I left out there. And when yeah. I was talking about the contemplative uh, teachers being that way, it suddenly hit me. Oh, yeah, that's why. <laughs> yeah, it sort of like seems like it's uh, You know, that's why yeah. the contemplatives fall into it or already are in it. I'm not sure. 
Okay. But yes, uh, yes, one reason that I got so concerned about this, I already knew Richard Rohr had this view, and I wrote about it in my article on his book, uh, The Universal Christ. And uh, so I already knew that, and there was a few other people I thought had it, but I found out this man named David G. Benner, who's written several books, uh, some of his books are used on Christian college campuses or recommended by uh, ca- Christian counselors. And in some cases, uh, his, at least one of his book would be required reading for a, a counseling degree. And this is on a Christian campus. And a few people have told me they read it in seminary. Mm. Now, the book that I'm referring to, and it's not just this one book, there's a few others of, of his people read, but one, the one that seemed the most popular was The Gift of Being Yourself. And it's actually a trilogy he wrote, and he has The G- Gift of Being Yourself, and then he has two others, um, Finding God's Will, or, or something about God's Will, and then uh, The Love Oh, now I've already forgotten the names of them, but <laughs> there's there's two others. So I read The Gift of Being Yourself, since that one seemed to be the most mentioned by people, by Christians. Mm. And I have an article on it on my website. Uh, and this was very, very concerning. He talks about the Christ in me and the Christ self. Um, he uses terms like that. Now, I can see how somebody would read this, and if you have, um, you know, a basic Christian doctrinal view, uh, you know, you believe Jesus died for your sins, and you believe you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and, you know, if you have these basic ideas of Christianity, you might read what he writes through that filter, yeah. and, and not see that he's saying something else. Now, I knew he was a follower of the perennial philosophy because I, I looked into him, and I, I didn't know it, but I suspected it strongly. Let me put it mm-hmm. that way. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, he is a master teacher at Richard Rohr's center. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. So that was yeah. a big clue right there. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> he runs a school called the Cascadia School of Living Wisdom. He apparently had removed the website for it before I could really look at it. And so I still Googled around and found a few things. Um, It seems to be an online type of school. So, and it's in Canada, it's based in Canada. But that title, Cascadia School of Living Wisdom, that's a clue that it might be the perennial philosophy. Mm -hmm. Um, And so his book, The Gift of Being Yourself, he talks about, Uh, how you have to come to certain points and see that who you really are, that the self, the self is important to know what the self is. And the book is written, and and to me, the language is sort of um, obtuse as far as what he's saying. It sounds very spiritual and very good, um, but I don't find it very clear Mm. Uh, in terms of what I know he's saying, Um, except in these little phrases he gives, like the Christ in me, the Christ self, Mm. the true self. And then he talks about the true self and the false self. Mm -hmm. And this is something Roar talks about, something with the Enneagram. Um, They all kind of tie together. It's also talked about in contemplative spirituality. Um, my my article, um, Contemplative Prayer, Is It Really Prayer?, which I, I wrote in like 2005, that was 15 years ago, uh, I talked in that article about the concept of true self, false self that was being taught by some of the contemplative teachers. So I had already come across that, and then it started cropping up again um, and with the Enneagram, and I see it with this perennial view as well. So my article focuses on how certain things he says are not biblical. And um, I I also read the book Living Wisdom. I couldn't find much about it. I found the book. I got the book, and it has a 2019 copyright. But I noticed that um, it had two ISBNs. 
Hmm. And the first one had 10 numbers, and the, and the, the second one has 13 numbers. All books have an ISBN. Um, and apparently, they changed from 10 numbers to 13 numbers in 2007. Hmm. So that all books after that have 13 numbers. Now, the fact that there were two numbers given makes me think there was an early, because it said it was a reprint. It gotcha. did say it was a reprint. So um, that means it already existed before, and it had to be before 2007. <clears throat> but I couldn't find it, and I couldn't find any information on it. I couldn't even find out where somebody said what, it, what the first yeah. book was and when it was you know, copyrighted. But that, to me, indicates it's an earlier book that he that was reprinted or redone. Living wisdom is just in your face, perennial philosophy. Yeah, it, it, it is just out there. And he just talks about it. He uses the word. He talks about um, uh, he talks about this uh, wisdom uh, he calls. And this is his term for God, the spirit of wisdom. And the spirit of wisdom inhabits all creation, including us, mm. including everybody. <clears throat> so the spirit of wisdom inhabits everything in creation. He talks about how God incarnated as creation. Yeah, that's just like you know, roar. That's, yeah, this is Richard <laughs> Roar all over. You your breath yeah. away. You're like, what? <laughs> God <laughs> incarnated as creation because God materialized. Yeah. By becoming creation. Now, this is very similar to what Richard War says when he says the first incarnation of Christ yeah. was creation. Yes. It's really the same idea. And that's panentheism, essentially. That's panentheism. And that's what um, that's one of the characteristics of the perennial philosophy is that it is panentheistic. OK. You cannot yeah. be a follower of that and not be a panentheist. Yeah. So wow. they go together. Wow. And. So God is enmeshed in creation, and so his presence is everywhere and in in everybody. So you have already have access to God. And like David Benner says, it's not that, um, and this is a big paraphrase, it's not that um, God isn't present with us. All that's lacking is awareness. Mm. So it's your awareness. Yeah. And in Living Wisdom, he talks about how you have to how you have to achieve a new consciousness and he even calls it Christ consciousness. Wow. And he says, this is the consciousness you have to get to. And of course, this is the awareness of the perennial philosophy. Wow. This is the awareness of the truth of this divine reality at the core of all religions. And that's what he's saying. And in the book, um, it's very interesting what he's doing. He tells the reader to read it slowly and to really kind of meditate on it, don't go, don't read fast. And then at the end of each chapter, he has these little points for you to consider or questions to consider. And he he has in those little sections uh, a sort of a guide to get you to think about these perennial ideas and to see them. It's a, I mean, you know. Some people might think it's harsh for me to say this, but I really think it's like brainwashing. Yeah. I think it's guiding the reader into this, adopting this view. Mm -hmm. um, so, and he says to, you know, read and then to meditate. He wants you to meditate, uh, to do these contemplative practices. Of course, doing contemplative practices because of the way they're done, uh, it opens your mind. And it basically your critical thinking skills aren't in operation. And so you're more receptive to things that mm. would be maybe you wouldn't accept otherwise. Yeah. Um, and so his book is just full of this. He even talks about the chakras that um, which are supposedly these seven centers that I, a lot of people know this from yoga because yeah. it's part a big part of yoga um, and these seven centers in the body. Uh, that go from the pelvic area to the, the top of the uh, crown, the top of the head. And he talks about them being portals to the inner and outer worlds. It's this very, uh, very esoteric kind of stuff. And you're saying this about. was published on a Christian publisher? Living, um, no, this is a reprint by okay. Whip and Stock. That's right. Well, I, I think they're secular. 
But this is used in Christian counseling education. I don't think I don't know if Living Wisdom is okay. The but Gift of Being Yourself and a couple of other gotcha. his, of his books, Finding God's Will, and the other one about love. I, I wish I could remember. It's the second book, and it's um, it's about love. This book, since it just came out in 2019. Probably, uh, it may be that of the people who recommend The Gift of Being Yourself and some of his other books may not even know about it. I'm not sure. Mm. I found it just because I was, after I did The Gift of Being Yourself, I thought I should read one more book by him. Mm -hmm. And I was looking at all the books trying to decide. And um, I, I was trying to decide, should I read that one or that one? Or is it going to be too much like the one I just read? And I came across by putting his name in a search box or something, I came across Living Wisdom and the title caught my attention. And I thought, okay, I want I wanted a book where he was more clear about what he believed so I could support my argument that he is a follower of the perennial philosophy. Gotcha, gotcha. Since he doesn't come out and say it in mm -hmm. The Gift of Being Yourself. But in this book, he does. You mentioned and, a really important point before when you said... When you first, you know, some, and, and I think this is true for a lot of Christians, when you're reading a book that is marketed as Christian, you're just assuming that you're operating from the same foundation, from the same yeah. biblical principles, the same worldview, the same gospel. Yeah. You're, you can, so it can be easy sometimes to interpret what somebody is saying through that lens, which is, right. is what you were talking about. So it's not always clear. I like that you brought that up. So as, you know, as we talk through this and, and as we maybe kind of uh, move toward talking about the Enneagram a little bit, with perennialism not being clear in all these books, what are some perhaps buzzwords people can be looking for, yeah. concepts that they can go, okay, that's a red flag, and I, I, I know that I can connect that with perennialism. What are some really practical things people can be looking for, even if they're going to counselors in churches or reading books or something along those lines? How can we recognize this? Okay, yes. Um, well, wisdom is one of the words to look out for. Okay. Um, if, if they say, uh, or and tradition is the other one. So if they say, you know, I follow the Christian tradition, or I follow Christian wisdom, or if they say we need to um, extract the wisdom in all religions or in other religions, like there are, there's wisdom in other religions, and we, we should not ignore that. That may be a sign that they're following per, the perennial um, tradition. Um, <clears throat> okay, so that's one way. Other, other things that I've seen, like David Benner does, the Christ in me, the Christ self, and uh, of course he uses Christ consciousness, which is actually really a term from the New Age, <laughs> mm -hmm. which got it from New Thought. Um, so any and anything where it looks like the self is being identified with Christ um, and then the true self, false self ideas might indicate a perennial view. Uh, so those terms about the self, the wisdom, the tradition, divine reality is another one. Uh, and also presence. A lot of times I see um, what I assume God to be for the perennial follower um, to be called presence. Or even the presence I've seen. Or the presence. The presence, yeah. yeah. So that's another term. Um, the one is another one. Um, uh, spirit, well, he has spirit of wisdom is a term Benner used. <clears throat> Whether others use it or not, I'm not sure. It's very possible. And I think especially to be alert for any reference to God in a somewhat impersonal term, uh, you know, not the normal way that we would speak of God, like God as father for a Christian. Um, it would be more impersonal. He would be like, that's why presence to me, presence to me is very impersonal when you just have presence, capital P. It's mm -hmm. like, well, what presence of what? What are you talking about? Right. You know, um, unless you're being specific, it's, it's just very impersonal. Um, it's kind of remote, you know. And then Jesus is talked about as a wise teacher um, and even as an archetype. Richard Rohr talks about Jesus as an archetype. And, oh, this is another thing I need to mention. David Benner is a depth psychologist, which means he's a follower 
of uh, Carl Jung. He's, he, in other words, oh. he uses Jungian psychology. Yes. And Richard Rohr is a big, a big admirer of Jung and often refers to Carl Jung. So if you're a Jungian psychologist, by the way, a lot of New Age counselors are, are Jung, most of them are Jungians. Um, this, there's this idea that Christ is the archetype because Jung came up with this idea of archetypes. And archetypes are figures of certain things like a hero, the mother, um, the lover, mm. uh, the fool. Uh, these are these figures that all of humanity understands and seeks out. It's, it, it's what Carl Jung called the collective unconscious. He believed that we all have, we're all kind of connected through this big collective unconscious. And so we recognize and seek out archetypes. And so Jesus was an archetype of a martyr mm. and, you know, the universal love. And Jesus recognized that he fit that archetype. And so he lived it out. Mm. Interesting. Um, <laughs> Jesus, it's so interesting and, um, how and, Jesus and, and, always and becomes. Benner says he does. Benner doesn't say that. Uh, I, I quoted that from something in one of my articles. But Benner does say things about Jesus that make Jesus sound more like a, he's more of a principle, yeah, or a symbol rather than Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Yeah, and you see that a lot sins. in the progressive church, especially where Jesus becomes. Uh, not always, of course. There are lots of progressive Christians who will declare that Jesus is God. But there's also uh, a, a group of progressive Christians who at least downplay the deity of Jesus, where they might portray him to be more of a highly evolved human that we mm. deified. They might see, you know, this cosmic Christ concept is all over the place, of course, uh, trickling down from Richard Rohr, probably. Yes. And so, so we definitely see this. And I wanted to point out, too, you mentioned that one of the buzzwords you might hear is spirit of wisdom. And it's just, mm -hmm. it might be notable to point out that this is actually a biblical phrase. The Bible says in Ephesians 1, 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. But there's always counterfeits of these kinds of things. And so yeah. that's what we have to bear in mind. Uh, you know, when you're when you're hearing that phrase used in conjunction with some of these other things, that can be an indication that there might be some perennialism underneath it. But if they're using it properly and biblically uh, in reference to the Holy Spirit, then then that's that's something different. But, uh, but th I think that's important to point out because there's always going to be counterfeit of language with these yes, types of yes, ideas. They're exactly. going to take some of the language, like we would use the word wisdom, we would use the word tradition, yes, yes. but they're changing the meaning of what these words uh, mean to communicate when they use them. And I think that's an important thing to bring up. So just before we move yes. on to the Enneagram, is there anything else that you wanted to add uh, to the discussion on perennialism and, and how you might warn Christians to just be aware of this that might be creeping into their church. Yes, and I think the point you just made was really good because you, that verse you read where it has spirit of wisdom, of course, in context, we know what that's talking about. And the way that Benner uses it, that's not how he's using it. And of course, we wouldn't say the spirit of wisdom inhabits creation. Right. Um, and, you know, I, in his book, Living Wisdom, when he talks about what is wisdom, he never talks about Jesus Christ as wisdom, which is also in First Corinthians, First or Second Corinthians chapters one and two, talk about Jesus is the wisdom of God. Mm. So, you know, that would be how I would talk about what wisdom is if I was writing about it. You know, I I would say, okay, let's look at Christ because yeah. he embodies wisdom. He never says that. And he doesn't use any of those verses from Corinthians about Jesus as the wis as wisdom or Jesus being wise. Um, that's to me very significant. Um, yeah, so I think that I think the issue here is that, what, of course, we're call we're called to test everything, and we have to really examine when we're re reading a book that's spiritual and is supposed to be Christian, if anything strikes you as odd or unusual, don't just 
don't think, oh, well, it's probably me. I just don't understand it. Or, um, you know, maybe it's just this author and that's his way of putting things. If because I because the language that Benner uses is different. And so if you see a lot of that, you need to look further. You need to investigate. You need to look at the context this person is, is speaking in. And also, is he leaving some significant things out? He never talks about the need to be forgiven. Mm. He never talks about redemption through faith in Christ. He doesn't talk about any of that. So there's a big missing, you know, the gospel is missing, basically. Yeah. But yet he wants you to find out what your real self is. Well, you know, what that that's not what we're told to do. We're not supposed yeah. to be searching for our real self. Yeah. So um, to me, even the title, The Gift of Being Yourself, is problematic. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't label it anything unless, you know, I, I read the book, which I did. Yeah. But it's a, a red flag, I think. Yeah. So this, this focus on self is a red flag and focus on having to change your perception and have this new consciousness of something or new awareness is a big red flag, too. So those kind of that kind of language will be around the perennial uh, writings. Mm -hmm.